good afternoon or good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, I'm Larry Diamond, Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and the uh, Faculty Leader of the Glo Global Digital Policy Incubator. On behalf of our co-sponsors, our other two, the Human Rights Foundation and the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, I want to uh, uh, welcome you to this, our final session of the Conference on the Rise of Digital Authoritarianism, China AI and Human Rights. We have a great program for you today. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to introduce uh, Taiwan's digital minister, Audrey Tang, who will come to us from a video she recently recorded for us. Uh, then we're gonna have a great panel discussion on what democracies can do to respond to China's emergence as an authoritarian AI superpower. And we're gonna close with a very fascinating and I think moving discussion, uh, again, recently recorded between uh, Eileen Donahoe, the executive director of the Global Digital Policy Incubator and Dr. Fei-Fei Li, the co-director of Stanford HAI. Let me begin now um, by introducing uh, our first speaker this morning. She is Audrey Tang, Taiwan's digital minister in charge of social innovation. Minister Tang is known for revitalizing the computer languages Perl and Haskell. In the public sector, Audrey Tang served on Taiwan's National Development Council's Open Data Committee and K-12 Curriculum Committee and led the country's first e-rulemaking project. The innovative digital strategies she leads have been essential to Taiwan's success in containing COVID-19. As you know, Taiwan is probably the most successful democracy in the world in this regard, and avoiding a pandemic lockdown in Taiwan. As one of the world's top open source software hackers, Minister Tang previously worked as a consultant for numerous technology companies, including Apple. As a leading supporter of open governance, she is also actively involved with uh, GovZero, a community dedicated to creating tools for civil society. So now we will be joined by Taiwan's digital minister, Audrey Tang. Hello, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's digital minister. I'm really happy to be here virtually to share with you some thoughts about how democracies should respond to PRC's emergence as a AI superpower. First, let's reflect a little bit about the term AI. To me, AI stands for assistive intelligence. And assistive intelligence, of course, is value aligned in the sense that like any assistive technology, it honors the person. On the other hand, it also must be accountable, meaning that if there is bias, if there is like governing problems and so on, there's always a way to participatory mechanism to make amendments to how the assistive intelligence works. However, the same word may mean very different things. In a PRC, AI means something like authoritarian intelligence. Just like in Taiwan, when we say transparency, or radical transparency, we mean the state need to make how the state works radically transparent to the citizens through, as you can see, the join platform, which has over half of Taiwan's 24 million population visiting the site on citizens' initiative, participatory budgets, and so on. However, in the PRC, transparency means the reverse meaning that the citizens are to be made transparent to the state. And so far from making the state accountable and transparent to the citizen, its use of the so-called social credit or Shohei Sinyo system shows in moving um, fashion how exactly does an authoritarian intelligence gathering works. It's not necessarily all in the national level. Many provinces uh, and regional governments within the PRC all made their own so-called social credit applications in a way to shape a very different norm, one that is based on the idea of citizens made transparent to the state. So what's the social credit system? It's rather more like a system of ideologies than any particular algorithm. The defining point is that 
the public behaviors of citizens are tracked comprehensively, and those who behave well, according to some criteria defined by any level of the government authority, get preferential treatment in education, in employment, household registration, etc. However, unlike traditional financial credit systems, there is a strong sense of public shaming. This citizen-to-citizen -citizen pressure part of it that shames people who have different to norm behaviors, and they were punished not only by disclosing their names, but also denying them travel on airplanes, on high-speed rails, and so on. And so in this sense, the social credit system enforces the state intelligence, making the people more transparent to the state authorities. But the two pillars of assistive intelligence, namely acting in the individual's best interest and providing a full account of when and why are those policies being made, are nowhere to be found. And so there are real dangers in this authoritarian interpretation of AI. First of all, it risks making the previously subtotal totalitarian regimes more fully total, as we see, for example, in Xinjiang. And not only in Xinjiang, but also the PRC is exporting its model of authoritarian surveillance through its Belt and Road Initiative to other jurisdictions looking for similar authoritarian control. Also, through face recognition apps and normalizing the use of face recognition, they gained a lot of profiling materials on not only citizens, but also their citizens overseas and also totally unrelated people in other jurisdictions that use the face recognition apps developed or sponsored by the PRC government, they all become part of this potentially social credit rating system that is part of a state profile on not only citizens, but also residents and also foreign nationals. And finally, it's basically shaping a what some scholars call a rule by law system. Whereas in the rule of law system, we understand the value alignment, accountability, the appeal process, the access to justice, and so on. A rule by law system ostensibly has a legal code or regulations and algorithmic code as well. However, the way to appeal to the biases and the decisions made by those kind of semi-autonomous pieces of code, whether code of law or code of algorithm, is completely opaque. There is literally no way for people to fork, that is to say, to take the code to a different direction, or to ask for accountability if they get wronged by the rule by law system. And so shaping that into an international norm will essentially make open innovation end-to-end -end innovations, which is a core of the internet culture, hard to reach and inaccessible and even seeming remote to the people who are used to these authoritarian norms. So how do we counter it? Well, it turns out that in Taiwan, we had a very long discussion ever since the Cross-Strait Service and Trade Agreement, or CSSTA, was in the talks. There's many people, many experts, holding multi-stakeholder forums and deliberations culminating in the sunflower occupy of 2014 that basically says we must reject prc suppliers in our then new 4g infrastructure the idea is that if there is a de facto state control if there is a norm for the Dang, for the chinese communist party to install its branches into those so-called private sector companies, then for each and every upgrade, we will have to do another systemic risk assessment to see whether those telecom infrastructures are still working in a way that's value aligned to us or whether it has been upgraded, uh, upgraded uh, with additional algorithms that will participate in their state surveillance and data collection um, plans. And because as we know, through the party branch controllership, um, the PRC can plug and play essentially leaders in the private sector. So a multi 
the systemic risk analysis that goes on for not just 4G, but also long-term evaluation, the evolution uh, of the 4G and now 5G and beyond 5G protocols are amortized. That will actually cost us a lot more in both the cybersecurity and the privacy fronts than, for example, if we work with Nokia or Ericsson. And so because of that, all five telecommunication operators in Taiwan are listed in the Clean Network Program, which is a new program. So we're happy that other countries are joining our vision uh, and rejecting the PRC suppliers from the core telecommunication infrastructure. Also, um, partly due to the strong consensus that emerged from half a million people on the street and many more online during the Sunflower Movement, as you can see, being live streamed uh, in real time. Uh, through WiMAX, actually, not through 4G. Uh, and the people at the time understood that for each and every sensitive and national security, including cybersecurity related projects, our tender documents must reject PRC suppliers. And that has been the path of what we call the clean procurement ever since then. So that for the past six years, not only we have zero PRC components in our 4G infrastructure, the same holds for our national projects, such as the National Health Insurance System that plays so much part into the anti-COVID um, conversation, also on the five telcos, which voluntarily participated um, in the digital quarantine system and so on. None of these systems run on the underlying technological stack that contains any PRC suppliers so that we can be assured that our AI are really assistive in a sense of assistive intelligence instead of just serving also for the authoritarian control purposes of the PRC. And finally, we have also established cybersecurity standards for the IoT devices. For example, the IP cams, which are very often turned into botnets or uh, used for nefarious purposes, these must adhere to the national cybersecurity standards. And because Taiwan makes so many IoT devices, we're now extending not only the 10 vendors that produce more than 27 IP cams and all passed uh, our lab inspection. But we're also actively seeking collaboration to work with other liberal democracies labs so that we can make sure that there is an entire clean stack when we make foreign conversations and offer a truly clean technological solution that is free from the authoritarian control of an authoritarian intelligence regime. So this is what I have to share today. And thank you for listening. Live long and prosper. Of so many themes that we've been addressing in this conference and an excellent bridge to the panel that I am now going to introduce of three uh, leading thinkers uh, in the uh, broad space of digital policy and confronting the challenge of digital authoritarianism. I'm going to introduce our three panelists now uh, in the order that they're going to speak, um, slightly different than what's on the program, since we're going to begin with Christopher Balding, who's going to take us a little deeper uh, into the challenge that we're facing here. Uh, Christopher Balding is one of the leading experts on the Chinese economy and financial markets, and especially on Huawei and Chinese banks and their relationship to the party state and state security in China. He's a Bloomberg View contributor and advises governments, central banks, and investors around the world on China. Until recently, he taught at Fulbright University Vietnam, and before that at the HSBC Business School of Peking University Graduate School. Next, we'll be joined by Anya Manuel, who is a, a prolific writer and thinker in this space and co-founder and partner uh, in Rice, Hadley, Gates & Manual, uh, a strategic consulting firm that helps U.S. companies navigate international markets. She's the author of the critically acclaimed 2016 book from Simon & Schuster, This Brave New World, India, China, and the United States. From 2005 to 2007, she served as an official at the U.S. Department of State responsible for South Asia policy. Uh, finally, we'll hear an opening remarks from Chris Messerol, 
a fellow in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution and the research and policy director of a, a leading peer program, I would say, uh, in wrestling with these issues, the Brookings AI and Emerging Technology Initiative. Chris, uh, his recent work has focused on the rise of digital authoritarianism. He has a very important uh, recent paper on the Brookings website. I recommend with Alina Polyakova exporting digital authoritarianism, the Russian and Chinese models. So uh, with that, I want to uh, welcome our panelists. We'll ask them each to make some opening remarks and uh, then uh, we will uh, engage in a conversation. So Christopher Balding, over to you. Thanks for having me today, Larry. Um, I think the thing that I want to start off with uh, is, is basically agreeing with everything that Minister Tang uh, said. Uh, I think uh, I had previously worked primarily as an economist uh, for many years, and then uh, within the past two years, uh, had uh, started down this rabbit hole of discovering all of this uh, data and what I was doing um, as I began researching uh, Huawei. Um, and I think what came out of that was uh, we, we often hear about uh, the data that uh, that companies collect on us uh, in democracies, and we often hear about uh, the data and hacking that uh, that China is collecting on both its own citizens and foreign nationals. I think once you see the level of detail in the and the mass amount of data that they are collecting. Um, not just on their citizens uh, at home, but also on foreign individuals and companies around the world, I think it puts it in a, a, a staggering new light. Um, just to give you one example, we recently uh, discovered a database uh, that was basically uh, run by a local government in China. Um, and it was truly staggering the level of detail that was in this. In addition to facial recognition, it was covering such details as was the individual wearing a scarf? How long was the scarf? What color was the scarf? Was there a pattern with the scarf? So when we talk about this, um, the level of detail that, that we're talking about, and that's just one very simple example that's going to apply to uh, domains across, uh, you know, from medical records to texts, uh, everything. Um, the level of detail that I think um, with, that the Chinese government is collecting on its own citizens is is, is not uh, is not understood. I think another uh, another factor is that they are uh, to, to to maybe uh, provide a, an entry point for Chris later on in the conversation is they are clearly um, using this model and uh, this data collection strategy that they have at home, um, and they are they are definitely working to export that model. Um, whether it is, uh, you know, we know, for instance, that Huawei and other companies are doing this uh, in other countries that are that are authoritarian leaning, um, and they are absolutely collecting uh, mass amounts of data on uh, on foreign nationals, even in open democracies. Um, and, I, and I think one of the things, and this is where my uh, my thinking has 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 changed substantially in the past couple of years. Uh, is, is I used to think that all of this, uh, to be honest, European talk about data privacy and GDPR uh, was, uh, was uh, you know, European socialism, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Um, my, my thinking on that matter has actually changed uh, enormously in the sense that I would probably now even go a few steps further than the Europeans um, in protecting data privacy because China is absolutely using um, the openness of the West um, uh, against us. Um, and, you know, just to give you one example from uh, the European uh, example, um, GDPR uh, has, has a very important loophole, and that is uh, if, if you are not, if you do not have a relationship with a consumer, uh, that data has to be stored in, in an EU jurisdiction. But if you have a, a uh, relationship with, with a company, that data can be stored in any jurisdiction of the company's choosing. Well, what happens is the end user license agreement for uh, CCTV cameras, IoT devices, and phone, um, the end user license agreement uh, from those manufacturers in China state for in almost all cases, very clearly, we will take your data to China and the data protection uh, in China is not nearly as good as it is in Europe. And it actually states that in the end user license agreement. 
Um, and so I think one of the things is, is that, uh, that from a philosophical standpoint is it's also become very interesting that uh, China, one of the key aspects of China is, is this massive data collection is intended not just to monitor for, let's say, potential acts of violence, but it is really intended to get into very intimate uh, aspects of our lives and, uh, and, and really act as a type of thought control or guidance. Um, and so the right to privacy as a citizen in a democracy and how we think about things, I think, is, is very important. And it also gets to the heart of what we in democracies think about uh, when we think about, you know, we are free from government interference, even domestically, um, not, just, uh, not just with regards to China. And so I think that would, that would be something that we should think about in democracies, how we manage those specific issues of data privacy and data security. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Christopher. Uh, I would just say uh, information is also leverage. And uh, I don't want the People's Republic uh, of China having that leverage over people like yourselves who might at some point be in positions of government authority uh, or of government authority again. And with that, I uh, introduce and hand the floor over to someone who did spend time at the State Department, may do so again in the future, who knows, uh, Anya Manuel. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Nice to see you all. And apologies for my tech issues. I'm actually dialing in from Europe, and so something went wrong, but I now should be on and joining you fully. So I apologize. I didn't actually hear what Christopher said, but I'll just pick up on some thoughts like we all discussed before this panel on, mm -hmm. so what are we all gonna do about it? What can democracies do together to ensure that we retain a strong lead in artificial intelligence and in the other key technologies, which is where really the race between China and the US is going to be joined. So far, the Trump administration, I would say, has woken up to the issue but their policies have been almost entirely defensive. It's build a moat around our technology, you know, stronger export controls, make it harder for Chinese companies to invest in American AI companies and others. It's time to play offense. So we should focus on what the US and our allies can do to compete rather than just focusing on keeping China down. And I'll just make four quick points and we, we can discuss them more in the Q&A. First, we've got to stop doing this alone. We have to work with our allies. Um, Mike Brown, Pav Singh and I have been talking for over a year about um, a, an idea we call the Technology 10, which would be a flexible structure bringing together countries along with academics and key um, folks from industry in flexible working groups to solve some of these issues. So one, for example, would be a working group on AI to come up with thoughtful uh, criteria and really a framework for how to do AI ethically, everything that you have been talking about in the sessions of this conference. Another one might be, how does the West stay in the lead on semiconductors? You could think of five or six or seven others. So that's one. How do we work with our allies? Two, of course, the U.S. and our friends need to stay in the lead on semiconductor design and have fabs. <laughs> As you all know, the state of the art fabs cost a lot of money. They cost 10 to billion, $20 billion each. They're mostly found in South Korea and Taiwan, some in um, Japan. I think the Trump administration here has leaned in the right direction by giving a bunch of incentives for TSMC to do build a fab here in Arizona. That's great. Those who are in the know say TSMC probably won't make their most advanced chips here, which of course defeats the purpose. So more needs to be done there. And I know there's the Chips for America Act that Mark Warner and John um, Cornyn and others are supporting. So people are starting to think about it, but it's a really important priority. So that was two. Three, we have got to boost our own federal research and development funding. Uh, during the height of the Cold War, the federal government spent up to 2% of our GDP on basic uh, R&D. Now we've been reducing, reducing, reducing precipitously in the past four years, and now we're down to 0.7% of our GDP. 
The private sector is making up a lot of that, but they're not necessarily investing in the R&D that keeps us the most competitive when we're talking about this from a national security issue. So clearly more needs to be done there. There is a Chuck Schumer bill out called the Endless Frontiers Act, which is trying to do some of that. My friends on the Hill tell me that this one doesn't stand a lot of chance of being passed. It's $100 billion over five years, which is a lot. But um, something of that form clearly needs to be done. And then the fourth point is, and Larry, you and I have talked about this, is to stay in the lead, basic research needs to be both safe and open. So there's been a lot of talk recently about restricting Chinese students from studying in the United States and researchers from being here. I personally uh, think that's a lot of overreach. I know Larry, you and others wrote a great um, edited volume warning of the types of activities that the Chinese and others are doing, uh, many of them illicit <laughs> or at least nefarious. And so it was an important wake up call that our academic institutions shouldn't be so naive. But the basic idea that we should keep the open system, I think, is important. And you can do a lot. I actually just finished a report with Artie Bienenstock, who was our former Stanford Dean of Research and Peter Michelson and lots of others on this. In our view, you can um, enforce the existing conflict of interest and funding rules, train people in what the Chinese and some others are trying to do to make them aware of it and make them less naive and train foreigners who are coming to work in our system and say, here are the consequences if you cheat. Here are the consequences if you download a bunch of IP off the Stanford servers and try to send it home. And they include jail time. And I think there's a lot you can do short of a draconian restriction and closing out basic science and research. And then a final piece of that, of course, is that we also need to make sure that our own STEM education system is first rate again. It hasn't been, there are a lot of trouble at K-12. That's of course hard, it's a state issue mostly, but there are small things you could do that wouldn't be very expensive. After Sputnik, uh, the Eisenhower administration put in place the National Defense Education Pact, um, Act, which created scholarships for people to study science, technology. In that case, it was also Slavic languages. Why wouldn't we do something like that now? It would cost between one and $3 billion a year, and I believe would be money well spent. Lots of other ideas, but I'll leave it there for now and we can have a conversation about it. Thank you. Great. So Chris Messerol, over to you. Thanks, Larry, for uh, having me and thanks for uh, Stan to Stanford for putting on this great event. Um, I think I'll, uh, rather than just kind of describing how China um, has been exporting its uh, AI and digital authoritarianism, I'll just build off of the uh, insights of uh, Mr. Tang and, and Mr. Baldwin and, and Anya's comments about, um, you know, what it is that we can do uh, to push back. And again, I would also um, really encourage the viewers to, to go and look at uh, Anya's papers with um, uh, Pav and Pav Singh and Mike Brown. They're really fantastic. Um, the, the main point that I would make um, here is that democracies, if we want to counter what China is doing, what we really need to do is be smart across the entire AI stack and be targeted for you know, how we want to push back. And so you know, China has methodically worked its way up from the hardware layer to the application layer and now increasingly to the standards layer. You know, but those layers are very different um, and require, you know, involve a different set of trade-offs and considerations in terms of how you know, we best want to counter what China is doing. Um, so with that framing, you know, there's really three points I would make. And the, the first is that we absolutely need to get our own house in order you know, at the platform or application layer. And this kind of gets to a bit what Christopher was talking about earlier. Um, we, we simply need to get our act together and begin to place clear and consistent guidelines for how digital platforms can govern the content, information and data that are shared in them. Um, in particular, for democracies to, to outcompete Chinese. AI-based apps and platforms in the long run, what I would say is that we need to have clear and consistent governance models for tech platforms like Facebook and Google. Um, democracy and human rights, just they won't win in a world where the only choice is between whether the Xi regime gets unfettered access to our data or whether Zuckerberg does. And so the, the good news here is that there's actually a lot of low-hanging fruit, both in terms of data and algorithms. Um, you know, so when it comes to data, I know Christopher talked about this earlier, but the e EU has already passed GDPR. 
California has passed its own legislation. And, you know, while I'm not really going to hold my breath for Congress to pass a, a comprehensive data privacy plan in the U.S., there is still a lot happening around data sharing that can go beyond uh, GDPR and kind of make the kinds of improvements that uh, Christopher was talking about, uh, including in the upcoming Digital Services Act in, in Europe. Um, so the, the point I would make uh, with data in particular is that even as China gets more aggressive about unveiling its own security, you know, data security and privacy model, it, it released its, you know, unveiled its big new plan a month or two ago. You know, there are very natural ways for us to outcompete them. Um, and I'd say the same is true on the algorithm side. There's a lot of movement, again, mostly in Europe, but also in the U.S. around algorithmic transparency uh, that, I'm, that I'm equally optimistic about. And I, and I bring this one up. You know, I think the, the TikTok controversy really exemplifies why we need this, right? If we're afraid of censorship and propaganda coming in via algorithm, the way to respond is not to kind of create ad hoc, you know, measures to target specific companies. The way to respond is to pass really robust algorithmic transparency legislation. And then if companies like TikTok aren't comfortable with the sunlight that that would bring, then they don't get access to our markets or other markets. Um, so I can say more about that. But the, the, the main point I would make is that we just need to uh, if we want to you know, win globally, uh, we need to you know, get our own house in order on data governance and platform governance. And the second point I would make is that um, we also need to be smart. Uh, and what I mean by that is we need to be a lot more targeted at the hardware and manufacturing layer. Um, Anya you know, talked about this briefly, but AI is based on data algorithms and computing power. And one of the most important trends that's emerged over the last few years is the growing importance of computing power in that triad given the, the marginal returns of data and the open sourcing of most algorithms. And so as with the, the platform layer two, you know, the, the good news here is that there's a lot we can do. Uh, the first is that um, we can target very naturally the weakest point in China's AI ecosystem, which is semiconductor manufacturing. You know, for all the effort that Beijing has put into Made in China 2025, their biggest flaw really remains semiconductor manufacturing. They, they simply don't know, uh, the easiest way I can put it is that they don't know how to build the machines that build the machines. Um, and this is kind of the flip side of what Anya talked about earlier in terms of building greater capacity out you know, in the U.S. and elsewhere. One thing we can do is deny capacity to China to be able to produce cutting edge chips, because the good news here is that only the U.S., the Netherlands and Japan produce the kind of advanced lith photolithography equipment that is used to manufacture cutting edge processors. Um, so rather than kind of blindly place export controls on things like GPUs or CPUs, you know, for which there are really you know, easy and ready substitutes, you know, we can impose some pretty smart controls that, that target only the hardware China can't produce on its own. Um, and the second thing in terms of being smart is just literally, and again, Anya kind of talked about this at length, but we literally need to just be smarter. We need to educate and recruit the best and brightest. Um, with AI, you know, AI compute is now outpacing Moore's law and doubling, you know, roughly, you know, every three, three to six months or so. And over the next generation, I kind of, I'm in the camp that thinks most of the breakthroughs in AI will happen because of aggregate compute and compute per watt breakthroughs, and that those will be the biggest driver of AI transformation. The, the catch is that there's a very small pool of people who can drive those breakthroughs, and we need to have as many of them as possible. Uh, we need to open our doors to the smartest engineers around the world, um, including and, and especially um, from China itself. Um, and then the, the last point I would make, in addition to kind of getting our house in order and being smart, is that, and this, again, it dovetails pretty naturally with, with Anya's comments is we need to make friends. So, you know, China at the standards layer, China's being a lot more aggressive um, recently than they have been in the past. And one of the things they noticed um, about, uh, you know, the American tech sector is the tremendous value that America gained and accrued over the past 50 years by having control over global, global tech standards in the post-war era. And as a result, they've kind of, you know, tried to invest in that pretty heavily over the past decade. Uh, not just around tech like 5G, but also applications like facial recognition technology. Uh, and one of the worries I have is I don't want the Xi regime setting the standard globally for how facial recognition technology should be used. Um, and so one of the things that that's going to mean, or there's kind of two things that I think the U.S. needs to do uh, and democratic countries need to do. One is to become much more involved and, and not just more involved, but more coordinated in how we approach global standard setting bodies. You know, the U.S. still has more people you know, working at the UN than China does, but we're not nearly as coordinated in terms of what we're pushing on and how we're kind of driving towards a, a specific agenda as the Chinese. The second is that we've kind of just rested on our loyal laurels and just assumed that, um, you know, anything that's coming out of the US is going to become de facto a global standard. And that's not true anymore. And so we need to think pretty hard about how we take internal standards bodies like the NIST and begin to kind of 
you know, have them have a greater presence on the global stage. Um, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll kind of end my comments here and we can talk more about um, more about them. But uh, the, the three things, just get our house in order, be smart and make friends. Thank you. Uh, well, thank all three of you. Uh, my hand is kind of cramped now because I couldn't write fast <laughs> enough to record everything you said that was, um, uh, you know, really uh, profoundly important. Uh, I want to throw out uh, a few questions for you to chew on further uh, now, uh, and uh, I'll go in the same order in which you initially spoke. And, uh, you know, you can each speak to one or two of them. Uh, Christopher, to to you first, uh, and I'll I'll express them all, and then we'll go in the same order. Um, maybe you could dilate a little further uh, on how the revolution of the Internet of Things uh, is going to uh, transform all of this, and I'd like you all, or any of you uh, who want to, to address something that we've just you know, touched on uh, lightly uh, and that keeps coming up uh, in several of our sessions, but I don't think we've really drilled down into, which is that the rules and standards for um, the future of the internet, uh, of all things digital, uh, for the platforms that we're going to be operating and the infrastructure that's going to, you know, be the basis of everything digital in the future. Uh, it's all being written now in shadowy, barely understood international forums, many of them under the aegis of the UN or um, uh, its um, uh, bodies like the International Telecommunications Union. These negotiations are going on. Uh, I have a friend uh, from a non-governmental but former governmental position who's been at many of them uh, and sees China kind of running circles around, uh, frankly, uh, American representatives and much of the West that we're not paying enough attention. So if any of you have any thoughts on that, I'd like to hear it. Uh, the third issue uh, I'll pose for you, Anya, in particular, is to ask you to spell out uh, maybe in a little bit more of the detail you did, and I think your seminal piece recently in the, um, uh, uh, what was it, the Financial Times? Uh, the, um, <clears throat> uh, the top 10 concept, and how would it really work uh, in, in practice, uh, and who would be the players, or what would be the uh, kind of rotating coalitions that could make that work effectively. And finally, to Chris, uh, at the risk of putting too much on the table, there's a lot of talk in one conference after another uh, that I've been involved with about algorithmic transparency. And of course, there's a debate between uh, the platforms and, let's say, civil society and government, on the other hand, about the legitimacy of this and how it would work in practice. but. If you could put a little bit more flesh on the bones of the concept of algorithmic transparency and, and um, how it could be secured and in a way governed or enforced, uh, I think our audience would be grateful. So again, Christopher, to you uh, to start off and respond to anything else you'd like. Sure. So I'll hit the IoT question and then uh, uh, delve into Chris's uh, area just just briefly. Um, so I think uh, you know one of the things is is when a lot of people think about uh, data privacy and things like that, uh, the first question that they ask is, well, you know, like with TikTok, well, you know, if if TikTok or China wants to watch me making a cat video, then it really doesn't matter. Okay, um, but the reality is, is that with a lot of uh, a lot of what's going on, um, it's not just your phone, which is recording a stunning amount of data on you, but it's also all these IoT devices. And the reason that the IoT devices are, are very important is, first of all, there is in almost in, in al almost all of them, there is just a stunning lack of any security whatsoever, and they and they are capturing large amounts of data on you. 
come. And I'll just give you one example. Um, so China actually maintains large amounts of databases that basically tracks uh, all batteries, all phone batteries in regions of China. Okay, and when we first discovered this, I was a little I was a little puzzled. You know, why is China keeping these vast databases of cell phone batteries um, all throughout the, all throughout China uh, in, in in a couple provinces? We discovered, and a and we we basically unpacked that. First of all, they have the ability to hack the phone through the battery. So first of all, they can actually get into the phone through through the battery. Second of all, even if you cannot hack the phone because there's uh, some type of uh, uh, device specific restriction, um, it also does provide you large amounts of very detailed information. Typically, it will provide uh, geolocation information. It will provide usage information if you're if you're on your phone, um, how often you've been using that phone. Um, the times of day that you're using that phone. It will provide a lot of information. And so a lot of times people think, well, they need to be able to listen to my conversations to understand what it is I've been doing. Well, they, they don't really need to. If if they know that the four of us have talked, they can probably say, oh, well, we know what you know uh, these four people were probably talking about. And if we're China, it's probably not good for us. OK, so there, there's a lot of there's a stunning amount of detail that they that they can do with this. And so whether it is, um, you know, and they're attaching uh, Internet connectivity to just about everything, refrigerators, ovens, you know, uh, that that voice, uh, that voice assistant in your home, everything. And so if that data is not uh, is not secured. That's a that's a very real problem. And the, and the issue is, is, is we've kind of talked about uh, playing defense, as Anya mentioned earlier. The problem is, is that basically right now in a lot of these in a lot of these, let's say, uh, simple devices, a lot uh, a large majority in, in most cases come out of China. And a lot of times, even the devices, for instance, like there's a very famous uh, camera maker in China, HIK, um, but nobody has an HIK camera. HIK has, you know, 50, a couple hundred uh, white labels. So you go to Amazon and you purchase a camera and you don't realize it's actually made by actually the PLA. And that data, typically in the end user license agreement, as we talked earlier, is being stored in China. So when we talk about these IoT devices, yes, it's absolutely the AI and, and things like that. Um, it's also a lot of these, you know, much, much stupider devices, uh, that, you know, to use a to use a blunt term and the information that they're able uh, that they're able to pick up on us. And then. To delve into one thing that is really in Chris's wheelhouse that I'll just uh, talk about. When we talk about these, these standards that I think are, are, are so important, one of the issues is, is, is uh, with, the, with the TikTok example. Um, because there really was no legal standard, um, the Trump administration was forced to use a, a national security uh, order um, that was really kind of straining, um, at, straining to really make the case because th there is no digital standard for, for data. There is no there is no legal standard for um, what we expect of data security, privacy, routing, algorithmic uh, transparency, all of these issues. So I, I, I think, and, and I'll let Chris speak more to that, but that is absolutely one of the key things that I think would be very important for all of us. You're so right. I think many of us are veterans of the World Internet Forum that used to be held in China every year, where they would invite people from around the world to sort of give you China's state of the internet. And the first thing they always did was give every participant a free Huawei, <laughs> which we then knew to leave nicely in our hotel room <laughs> and not take home with us. Um, but more seriously, I, I've just, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I just wanted to underline what Chris was saying on the rules and standards point, because this is so esoteric and frankly, my, it can be mind numbingly boring, but it's critical. And you are so right, Chris, that it's, it's the US just assumed because we have since the dawn of the internet always just dominated the space that we would continue to do so. And the Chinese have frankly been incredibly smart. And one of the complications is that it, in some cases it's UN bodies, often it's private sector NGOs like 3GPP has a huge role, others, that's all fine and good. If everyone is being honest, and bring forward the best standards and the best standards. 
What the Chinese have started doing in, in several cases that Melanie Hart and I actually wrote a piece on this this summer, in several cases that have been documented, they will have pre-meetings with the Chinese companies and say, we'd like you to vote this way. <laughs> and sometimes that means on 5G, it meant, could you please vote for the Huawei standard, even if you think somebody else's standard is, is much better? Now, that's not always happening, and we should be a little careful not to paint the Chinese in, in, in a darker light than they need to be painted. And I also would hesitate, and Chris, I'd love your views on this, but on the tech standards, I'd hesitate to go to a model to emulate the Chinese and say, well, this is going to be all top-down government run and this is going to control it or someone in the U.S. government is going to be in charge because actually the best standards come when the technologists are in charge. But the same thing that I mentioned with keeping basic science open, allowing people to understand what's happening here so they can be less naive, maybe having a pre-call before one of these important standards meetings and saying, hey, by the way, this is what the Chinese are up to. You guys might want to get on the ball and just watching it a little bit more carefully than we have been. I think minor adjustments like that can make all the difference. Um, but I wouldn't want to go to an entirely top-down model. And why don't we just, I don't know, Larry, if you don't mind, what if we just stick with the rules and standards piece and then I can talk about the Tech 10 kind of after Chris has a chance to chat. Okay. okay. I'll come yeah. back to you in a minute. Um, Chris? Yeah, I mean, I just, I, again, I would kind of echo everything that, uh, I hope this isn't turning into a boring kind of echo chamber, but I, I would, you know, foot stomp everything that was said. Um, the The two points I would make, um, on standards and global kind of adoption of standards is that there's really two pieces to it. And I, I completely agree. We don't want a top down kind of standard by diktat coming out of the White House. We want, you know, an open kind of tech driven standard or scientist driven standards process. But what we need is just a lot more coordination. I and mean, we need to be having the same kind of pre calls, you know, with different stakeholders. We need to go in with a much clearer and consistent agenda about what we're trying to achieve. Um, and so that's one point is just, it's not just being there, it's being coordinated and kind of driving in the same direction uh, in the way that China has been able to do. Um, the second is that what China is also doing is they're not just focusing on what's happening in Geneva or kind of other areas you know, where, where these global standards conversations happen. They're coupling it with really intense on the ground lobbying in capitals around the world. So they're going to West Africa, they're going to East Africa, right? They're going to South Asia and they're kind of, you know, they have a clear sense of what they want to do on the standard side, and they're building up support piecemeal country by country around the world in a way that, frankly, I think, you know, again, it just kind of reflects more complacency than anything else on our end. But we're not we're not having those conversations on the ground that then get kind of ported over into support at fora like the U.N. Um, so I would say that those two things need to happen in tandem, greater coordination on our end. And we can't just assume that the only conversations that matter are in D.C. or Geneva because they're not. They're, they're all over the world now. Well, what could be a more perfect segue uh, to asking uh, Anya to elaborate on what a more coordinated democratic approach globally would look like? Uh, so why don't you um, kind of expand on this concept of a kind of flexible and overlapping coalition that is loosely encompassed by your idea of a tech top 10, Anya? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, there, there's starting to be, there's a small group of us kind of thinking about this, iterating in the space. CNAS has done a lot of great work on this. I think Richard Fontaine is coming out with a piece in Foreign Affairs that has a slightly different view. So the, I think the bottom line point is it's got better coordination has to happen and has to happen soon. <laughs> and the details remain to be worked out. The structure that I would favor is something that, as I said, is really flexible. And I know that's hard for governments to do. So in some of the reports I've read on this, people say, well, you need like a new OECD and, you know, the um, Downing Street, the Boris Johnson administration has come out with an idea of a democracy 10. But the countries in it, in these other versions of this I've seen are static. And that's just not how technology works. The way I would envision this is, for example, on semiconductors, you would invite the countries that lead on semiconductors. You know, the Netherlands, the U.S. that make the semiconductor manufacturing equipment that both of you talked about earlier. 
um, then probably Korea, maybe Taiwan, although that's complicated, Japan, the US, maybe one or two others. And you would have at the table um, some of the key CEOs, and I would bring business in right away because, frankly, some of the pushback we're getting from U.S. business on the restrictions on them to exporting to China and others come because, you know, no one's come up with an alternative for them. It's their biggest market. <laughs> Understandably, they're a little bit frustrated at all of that, that they're essentially being shut down. So you need to have a dialogue saying, hey, here's the real national security concern. Here's how we stay in the lead. What do you think we need rather than just lobbying us for um, more support for building fabs everywhere, which obviously no government can support? What are we going to do? And you have a working group that meets over time, comes up with real actionable things that can then be implemented in the government. So a working group would include some CEOs, some government representatives, and maybe one or two, a few academics. And you might change over time. A group on AI might have a totally different composition. There, maybe you want the Israelis at the table. Maybe you'd want the Indians at the table for some of these, but not others. And then so on and so forth. There could be a group on export controls. You probably would want that with more European countries and maybe the EU at the table. And so that's how we're visioning this, um, the Tech 10 concept. It's so far, um, it, it's a hard thing to get right. And I fully acknowledge that. There are small attempts at it. I mentioned the UK approach, which I think is the farthest along, though even they haven't gotten much further than suggesting it. I don't know any major power that's picked up on it yet. The Trump administration is trying a really piecemeal approach. So Esper recently announced his little AI partnership with other defense departments, I guess. Um, the State Department has confusingly two or three initiatives that do bits and pieces of this, but don't seem to be very coordinated within the U.S. government, which brings me to my final point. This is really hard to do well. And in the U.S. government, we are just awful at coordinating tech policy. And so another idea I've been thinking through with some colleagues is how do you do that more effectively? I know Tom Donilon and others have called for having a deputy national security advisor for tech that would work more closely with OSCP because one of the things we're seeing now is that commerce comes out with restriction on sending semiconductors abroad. Treasury doesn't necessarily know when, when some of the online student ban things came out this summer. Apparently, the Department of Education wasn't aware and the State Department wasn't aware, which is a big problem since they grant the visas. So a little more coordination within our government on all of these tech issues is very much in order. Great. Uh, I'd like to uh, talk about imports and exports now, if I may. Uh, first, I'll read a question uh, that's been posed uh, by my colleague, uh, our former ambassador to Russia, director of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, Mike McFall, who um, asked about exports uh, and seeking to set international norms and standards. What would you all recommend that U.S. Uh, that we What would you recommend that we do about U.S. tech companies exporting products to uh, aid autocracies around the world? This is an issue that has come up uh, before. And should we um, uh, slap uh, export controls on some of this technology that can aid uh, digital authoritarianism? Uh, and he mentions the complaints about Sandvine and Cloudfair, uh, for example, recently helping the Belarus dictatorship. And uh, let me lay, uh, in a way I haven't heard addressed so far in this conference, uh, imports on the table. Um, you know, you could say, well, we could uh, pass a law that would uh, 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 ensure uh, in a legal sense uh, that um, any foreign company would have to get, uh, would have to respect the privacy rights of um, uh, American users uh, in order to be able to uh, operate here in the U.S. or even to put their Internet of Things technology into U.S. markets. 
but could we uh, trust and verify uh, their compliance with that? Or should we, uh, Christopher, particularly to you, uh, simply ban uh, certain uh, Chinese uh, uh, devices that um, you know we can't uh, ensure uh, would be in compliance? So uh, why don't we talk about imports and exports for a moment? Uh, maybe go in reverse and start with Chris, and then to Anya and Christopher. Yeah, so I would say that the, I would make two points on the, on the export side. I think the important thing to do it doesn't make sense to place export controls if there's readily available substitutes, right? So you need to find kind of you know what are the technologies that they can't get anywhere else, and so or that they can't produce on their own. And I think there there's a really small class of technologies that that fit that category. Um, one which I talked about earlier are these things called advanced uh, photolithography machines, which kind of etch the processors in silicon. Um, and it's you know when you're when you're trying to create something with you know six nanometer precision or you know at that scale, it's pretty challenging to produce those kind of machines and technologies. And China just has not been able to build that capability yet. Um, and you know so that is kind of immediately where I go. There's also some other kinds of sensors, like the Netherlands has some of the best um, sensing equipment uh, in the world for things related to computer vision, right? Um, and so the Netherlands, uh, to their credit, actually have started to place pretty strong export controls on some of their best cutting edge uh, sensing equipment, which makes it difficult for, um, you know, the Beijing to be able to, to make the, you know, the kinds of uh, facial recognition technologies uh, that they would like to use. Um, they're, they're, they're still able to make some substitutes, but they're not quite as good as they would be otherwise without you know, with those sensors. Um, so those are the, the two kind of, um, uh, immediate technology that come to mind. There's a third, but it's a little bit of field from AI, which is biotech. I think we're going to come into this issue very quickly in the coming years around some of the leading biotech equipment that's primarily based in democracies. But China, you know, uh, has expressed interest in using and is starting to use. But I think it's going to come to a head in a few years, um, and we should start having that conversation now. Um, on the on the import side. Um, I think the uh, technologies that we need to be most concerned with um, are the ones that are really hard to verify, um, you know, not just on hardware, but that have to do with information assurance. Um, and so, you know, things like Huawei's kind of equipment um, for telecommunications infrastructure, that's kind of where I am most concerned about any kind of equipment coming from China. It can be difficult to verify um, just the physical hardware itself because the the you know, it's very easy to change things at small scales that, that are difficult to uh, pick up on. Um, and if they were able to compromise that equipment, um, you know, the consequences to American intelligence and American society would be pretty significant. So um, I, I would, you know, I can sp speak more about it, but I think that that's probably the area where we most need to need to pay the most uh, attention. Back over to you. Yeah. Right. I would agree with Chris because Mike, question is right on, except you very quickly are banning a lot of things without solving the problem. And I think this was Chris's point, don't do an expert control if they're easy substitutes. And for most of these technologies, there really are. <laughs> right? So that's the problem. And then pretty soon, so you're starting with export controls, but then are you going to stop American companies from investing in things like Hick Vision, Sense Time, others? Maybe we haven't talked about that yet, but how far does this go? And is it really possible to put the genie back in the bottle, especially on digital authoritarianism? And I think probably not through export controls. So you can do other things to, you know, inoculate the world, kind of what both Chris and Christopher were talking about. Do you have one coherent set of standards for what would be appropriate privacy protections? So you're not picking on TikTok and, and WeChat, but you have one standard. You say you meet the standard you're in, you don't meet the standard you're out. Um, that's how I would try to solve the problem. I know that's a lot harder, but otherwise you're just playing whack-a-mole and you're going to lose. No, not a very satisfying future uh, if that's what we're doing. Christopher? Right. 
Yeah, so I, I generally agree with uh, with uh, my fellow panelists. And the story I remember is uh, back when Saddam was in power in Iraq, uh, the U.S. government blocked a lot of uh, chips to to him uh, to prevent uh, his his weapons program. And then over time, they they noticed that uh, that I believe it was uh, PlayStation exports to Iraq were soaring, and they they uncovered this and they said, "What's going on here?" And what they realized is they were pulling out the chips from the Xbox or, or the PlayStation and putting them in, in guided missiles. Um, so that's a, that's a perfect example of when you talk about trying to restrict exports. Um, if, if you're just blocking it and there's all these other substitutes, you, you've done nothing but uh, but kind of in, in, encourage the problem. Um, and, and I think what when if, if you expand this to the software uh, issue, uh, you know, just to take an example, how do you verify? And I, I think this is something that um, as as a lot of these as Chinese apps uh, and other apps, uh, not just Chinese, um, become so ubiquitous. And this is also applies to IoT is when we talk about these standards, one of the issues that would be very reasonable to include is some type of standard is how is data being stored? How does data being routed? Um, and just to give you one example, um, Zoom, no matter where you are in the world, routes almost all traffic through China. OK, Larry, if you and I were talking between Palo Alto and Los Angeles, there's no reason for traffic to go from Los Angeles to Shanghai and then back to Palo Alto. OK, there's only one reason that that, that would happen. OK, so when we talk about these types of standards and whether it's IoT, whether it's how data flows, how data is stored, these are the type of standards that I think for especially American consumers and companies are going to be most important. Great. Um, I, uh, we have just a few minutes left, uh, so we're going to have uh, uh, one final round here, and I'm going to uh, combine uh, three questions. Uh, I'm going to read the first one because I think it's a great question. Uh, how can the U.S. reshift the global narrative away from the U.S.-China schoolyard fight towards a more inclusive fate of democracy question? And how can digitizing countries be similarly courted to counter Chinese influence along the digital Silk Road? And several of you have already uh, uh, spoken to, as you have, Chris, the question of all these other countries beyond China in the top 10 or the top 15 uh, in Africa, um, elsewhere in Asia, Latin America, and so on. And this leads to my other two questions of whether we're really, um, you know, whether we have the capacity to wage this battle internationally, not just uh, in terms of the training of scientists uh, and engineers, but in the training of diplomats here and abroad to understand the issues uh, and what's at stake in these global forums, including our diplomats in Africa, Latin America, and elsewhere, who are even political counselors or ambassadors and not necessarily science and, and technology uh, experts within the embassies. And so finally, um, as someone asked whether we should, more countries should have digital ministers uh, like Audrey Tang, and maybe the United States should have one. So um, uh, let's conclude uh, in the same original order of Christopher, Anya, and Chris. Go ahead. I think one of the one of the issues here is that what what I think you're you're seeing in a lot of ways is, that, is I think you're kind of generally speaking in the middle of a let's say a fracturing of. Uh, of the world in a sense, um, in the sense of digital, uh, you know, products, supply chains, uh, data flows, things like that. Um, it, you, you're kind of, I think, seeing this crack between uh, how data is used. You know, um, Anya referred to earlier about uh, the Chinese would be very unified. Um, I don't think most American diplomats, from my conversations, would see representing Facebook interests as their primary concern. Um, they don't see uh, their interests in working with Facebook as we want Facebook to do X because this helps U.S. global dominance. Um, I, I don't think that's their general approach to the problem. That is the Chinese approach to the problem. That's why they marshal uh, their companies to say this is how you're going to vote um, frequently. Um, 
So I think it's a very different approach. And I think that's leading to what we're seeing is, is this kind of uh, split of, of how things uh, are happening. Um, I do think it is, uh, and I would even expand it probably beyond uh, 10 in different ways. Um, but I think this idea of um, ensuring uh, things like supply chain integrity, how data is managed between countries. Um, this is why, uh, you know, Facebook has, uh, is, is storing so much data in Europe now. Um, all of these issues, I think, are, are absolutely fundamental. And you're absolutely seeing this split where uh, countries are, are realizing, and I think it's really sped up over the past six months, this is something very real and we have to confront it now. I think the challenge is, as, as Anya has noted, is that these issues change so fast that, you know, if you pass legislation in six months, it could be out of date. Um, so so how, do you, how do you confront that situation? And it, it, it's, it's a very thorny issue. I mean, there's, there's no way around. Anya? Thank you. I love the question about the schoolyard fight. And I think it's so right on because in my view, by bullying and browbeating the world about 5G, instead of letting the technical folks talk to each other and really understand that there is a real issue here and it's apolitical, <laughs> we have created an equivalence somehow between the United States and China. And that is just not true. <laughs> right? So some of the things I was talking about earlier are to get us, frankly, back on the right foot with our friends and allies to say, hey, we want to help all of us succeed. We want to help all of us remain the most competitive technology countries on earth and to compete with China. Bring it on, right? Let's have a fair competition. And I think you do that by reformulating this as a positive strategy as opposed to shutting China out. So that's on the schoolyard fight. Um, on digital ministers, absolutely, there should be more Audrey Tangs in the world. <laughs> She's so wonderful. And I've interviewed her a couple of times now for things like this. And it's just the combination of being irreverent and funny and how you educate your populace about um, election interference, which I think she didn't talk very much about today. But what Taiwan did was absolutely first rate and how they just used the Chinese playbook against them and used humor to counter the disinformation. We're just not doing any of that. We seem to just always be screaming at each other. So yes, more Audrey's. And finally, I just wanted to close with, you know, we're talking about digital authoritarianism, absolutely important, but Chris already mentioned it when he mentioned biotech. There's so many tech issues that are just around the bend that we're not quite focused on yet. And I'd like us as a country and as a group of friends and with other countries to start thinking a little bit ahead. So biotech is one of them. It's pretty late in that game because, you know, CRISPR is already happening in China and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Lots of other things that we can still talk about. But one that no one's really talking about yet and that I personally am very concerned about is fintech. Well, when you look at how dominant... Alipay, Ant Financial, WeChat are in the global payment system, we should no longer take for granted that the dollar is always going to be the currency that clears most transactions in the world. You just won't need the correspondent banking system. And what we're doing in the U.S. at least is not intentionally, but just because it's easier if you're a bureaucrat and you don't know something to say no, rather than to experiment and say yes, we are really shutting down a lot of fintech innovation in our own country, and we're creating a huge opening. And if we don't wake up in two years, we'll have another 5G on our hands. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Chris? Yeah, I I will, I'll start by just foot-stomping the fintech issue. I think in addition to paying attention to just the value that the U.S. has accrued from standards control, they've also, obviously, you know, China's also very keenly aware of the value of the, to the U.S. of having the, the global reserve currency. And I think they're clearly investing very heavily in their own fintech sector as a way of trying to weaken uh, the global you know, hegemony, basically, of the dollar. And so that's if they're able to kind of uh, make inroads in that area, it'll have pretty significant strategic consequences for the U.S. Uh, and other democracies around the world that I think we need to pay a lot more attention to. And I think the natural place to start, frankly, is to open up more innovation in that space, as Anya said. Um, the the other points I would say uh, to your question about um, what we should be doing more broadly, I think 
One is increasing capacity, you know, not just in terms of digital you know, ministers, which are great, but like throughout all of government, as you talked about, I know the National Security Commission on AI had a, as part of, I think it's second quarterly recommendations last summer, put a lot of thought into what that might look like, especially in the State Department. And I, I would encourage folks to go look at those recommendations because I, I think they're absolutely spot on that we, we just need greater talent or a lot more talent within the State Department and across the USG uh, that's familiar with, with technical issues. Um, and then the, the second thing is at a high level, I think, you know, this will obviously depend a bit on, on the next administration and the outcome of November, but I, in an ideal world, in my view, the, you know, sometime in early 2021, there's a clear uh, communication coming from the US and from uh, the EU and other democracies around the world, um, articulating just a shared vision for the importance of uh, tech governance to democracy. Uh, we're not going to agree on things, you know, on a narrow, narrow level around things like privacy, but I think we share a lot more in common than we're currently communicating to the world, right? If you're one of the 5 billion people that's not in North America or not in Europe or not in China, you have China coming in on one hand and giving you like a turnkey solution for here's our tech, here's how to govern it, just use it. And it's simple and it's easy to understand what's going on. There's no corollary to that coming out of democracies. And I think we need to kind of put our best foot forward and say, you know, we're not, we don't, we shouldn't, we absolutely shouldn't have the same kind of top-down approach, but I think we're, we're really missing the boat in terms of communicating a clear story about how democracy and technology should, uh, should intersect. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, what, uh, you know, incisive and eloquent uh, way to conclude this superb session. Uh, from all three of you, I just, uh, I had high expectations and you greatly exceeded them. So uh, thank you, Christopher Balding. Uh, thank you for Anya, uh, thank you Anya Manuel, And thank you, Chris Messerol for this great session. I wanna say uh, to our listeners that we're gonna put um, your various papers and things you've referred to from this session and others on the website of our China Global Sharp Power Project at the Hoover Institution uh, so that people can get access to some of your writings. And uh, I also want to say uh, that the challenge of the global digital currency uh, that China is going to seek to roll out and dominate international financial transactions with is definitely something that we're going to uh, take on in the future. So thank you, uh, all three of you. And well, it's my pleasure now to welcome you to the final part of uh, the final session of this great conference on um, uh, China AI and human rights. Uh, we are extremely honored uh, to have as our closing keynote speaker uh, the co-director of Stanford's Human-Centered uh, Artificial Intelligence Institute, uh, what we fondly call HAI, uh, Dr. Fei-Fei Li. Uh, Dr. Li is the inaugural Sequoia Professor in the Computer Science Department at Stanford University. She served as director of Stanford's AI Lab from 2013 to 2018. Uh, she um, has been a vice president at Google and served as chief scientist of AI ML, that's artificial intelligence, machine learning at Google Cloud. She's recognized as one of the leading experts in her fields of AI, machine learning, deep learning, uh, computer vision, and AI plus healthcare especially ambient intelligence systems for uh, healthcare uh, delivery. She has been elected uh, and awarded uh, many prizes and honors. In particular, I will note that she is an elected member of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, I want to also uh, introduce to you again, uh, my colleague, the executive director, of the Global Digital Policy Incubator, Eileen Donahoe, who after Dr. Lee makes her remarks, will be in conversation with Fei-Fei Lee. So uh, Fei-Fei, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, thank you, Larry, for that gracious introduction, and thank you to my Stanford colleagues, in particularly you and Eileen Donahoe, for not only allowing me the opportunity to deliver these closing remarks, but also for partnering on this phenomenal multi-day seminar with the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI, where I am a co-director. So, as an immigrant and American. I'm continually grateful to live in a country in which each individual matters. We may differ in our skin color, gender, wealth, or cultural heritage, but we're inherently equal when it comes to our dignity, our rights, and our freedom. Of course, we continue to struggle to fully live up to this ideal, and much work remains to be done. But after millennia of civilization, I believe our greatest achievement as a species is the recognition of our shared, inalienable humanity. As an educator and researcher in AI for the past twenty years, I've been fortunate to witness truly historic changes from the inside. First, on an academic level, then. At a staggering industrial level, and now at an increasingly complex global level, not since the atom was split has a single technology gone from an intellectual curiosity to a force for global change so quickly. Given the speed and scale of its growth, the governance of AI is a topic in urgent need of discussion. Who will shape and control this technology? Who will benefit from it? And how might this technology be misused by individuals, corporations, or even nations? These are difficult questions, but it's been heartening and、uh, really riveting over the last few days to hear such an impressive panel of thinkers grapple with them so thoroughly. I immigrated to this country as a young teenager, and was immediately enamored with its history and fun- founding ideals. In particular, I, my reverence for the values outlined in our country's constitution has stayed with me to this day, and continues to influence my point of view as a scientist and educator. No matter the form this technology takes. In the years to come, we have a responsibility, as individuals, as a nation, and as a global community, to ensure that the development and deployment of AI is unanimously human-centered. That's what propelled me and my colleagues here at Stanford to start the Human Centered AI Institute, and motivates us every day. To work on the advancement of AI research, education, policy, and outreach that can make the human condition better. I've dedicated my life to this field in part because its potential to elevate the quality of life of communities all over the world. It will be felt across much of our lives in the coming years, with changes already taking shape. In fields like transportation, education, and manufacturing, but what excites me the most, and where a large part of my research has been focused on for a number of years now, is the future of AI and healthcare delivery. Consider hospital-acquired infections, for example, which are implicated in the death of more than ninety thousand patients every year in the United States alone, and in the time of the COVID pandemic, it's even more relevant for our patients and clinicians. By helping overworked doctors and nurses better track their hand washing habits throughout each shift, many of these tragedies are preventable. This takes a level of consistency and rigor that even the most disciplined among us struggle with. But with AI-powered sensors installed throughout the hospital, continual awareness of hand hygiene practice becomes possible and even trivial. Sensors can serve other roles as well, 
Once installed, like tracking instruments during a surgical procedure to ensure proper use and proper count, recognizing when vulnerable patients are in need of immediate help, or issuing alerts when an ICU patient has gone too long without engaging in physical activity. This kind of tracking is especially helpful for seniors living in care facilities, often transformative in fact, where patient populations dramatically outnumber caretaking personnel. So what I just said is a great example of what human-centered AI looks like. Its potential for cost savings throughout a hospital are obvious, but that's not why it exists. Instead, it's motivated by a desire to make a meaningful difference in the lives of real people, caretakers, patients, and their families. Human-centered AI is also approached and should be also approached with concerns like privacy in mind. In our own work, we began our research by in-depth conversations with clinicians and patients to hear their concerns for privacy. We work continuously with bioethicists to understand the ethical impl implications and to explore the best possible technical approaches re respecting that framework. We've demonstrated how sensors that record only depth rather than full color information can help preserve accuracy while obscuring individual identities. Now we've, wor we've been working with computer security experts to develop secure and privacy aware machine learning algorithms, including differential privacy and federated learning approaches. Above all else, human-centered AI is intended to augment humans' capabilities rather than replace them. As a daughter of two aging parents, I've spent a lot of time in the hospitals, from surgery rooms to ICUs to emergency departments, and I'm always struck by how deeply human the medical profession really is. This isn't something I can imagine changing. Many of our lives have been enriched by our relationships with caretakers, especially in times of need. And this technology is intended to support them, not to interfere or replace. But not all applications of AI are built with these values in mind. More and more, we're witnessing this technology's capacity for harm when it's deployed without concern for fairness, transparency, and human benefit. A prime example is algorithmic bias. For years, analysts have been studying the potential for AI to reinforce age-old human prejudices, especially when machine learning models are trained on biased sources of data. Additionally, the explainability of AI, that is, a model's capacity to explain how its conclusions are reached in terms, in terms a human can verify and understand, has been an active topic of research in recent years and continues to evolve. This kind of accountability and transparency is especially vital when AI plays a decision-making role in finance, medical treatments, or criminal justice. Even worse is the active malicious use of AI. The term deep fake, for example, has entered the cultural lexicon in recent years as generative machine learning models have demonstrated their ability to spin lifelike imagery from thin air and the recent GPT-3, the third generation of OpenAI's new text-generating model, can write remarkably believable prose on nearly any topic with minimal human oversight. Democracy depends on an informed electorate, and we have a responsibility to ask what its future look like when the media voters consume, uh, when the media voters consume can be so easily and effectively manipulated. 
in the extreme, AI is not merely malicious, but a vehicle for digital authoritarianism at a national scale. We've heard in this conference how authoritarian governments are using AI to surveil and suppress their citizens, to censor and stifle dissent, and to promote a, des a desired narrative, if not outright disinformation. As this technology becomes more powerful, more affordable, and more widely deployed, corporations and states alike will wield unprecedented control over individuals. This is why it's so important that democratic institutions across the world stay informed and work together to identify and combat such abuses of this technology and build a world in which all AI is human-centered. It is for these reasons I co-founded the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI, which we commonly refer to as HAI, with Professor John H. Mendy, Stanford's former provost and a philosopher. The goal of HAI has been to just not just study the technology of AI, but to also address the societal implications of this technology. Now, by not only ensuring the designers and creators of AI are of diverse backgrounds and perspectives, but also fostering a pathway for various stakeholders to be present at the creation of this technology. At HAI, we have included people across disciplines from law, engineering, philosophy, neuroscience, to the humanities and social sciences. And we have looked beyond academia to include government, civil society, and in industry at the table of these critical discussions and developments. For AI to serve the collective needs of humanity, we must include insights from all of these fields and buy in from all of these stakeholders. HAI is guided by three intellectual tenets. First, we must recognize AI is no longer a niche computer science and technological field of study. Its human and societal impact are too profound. We must invite social scientists and humanists to participate and oftentimes to lead the study of AI's societal impact, to understand it deeply and to forecast the changes and to guide policy. Second, as I shared in my healthcare example, instead of replacing humans, which so many fear, AI should augment human capability and amplify our ability to do more. My colleagues and friends around Stanford are working on how to use AI and machine learning or data-driven technologies to make the human experiences better, safer, or more productive including education, manufacturing, agriculture, healthcare, and beyond. This brings me to the final important tenet. If we want AI to collaborate and interact positively with humans, this technology should be more inspired by the intricacies of human intelligence and behaviors, whether it's human's superb capa capability of flexible learning creative thinking, or our ways of expressing and experiencing emotions and compassion. But America is so much more than Silicon Valley. I've seen firsthand how much talent lies just beneath the surface. surface. Often far from the coastal regions, we tend to disproportionately favor. By, but even in 2020, so much of this country's talent remains untapped, often due to historical imbalances in opportunity that have yet to be fully resolved. That's why I started AI for All with a student of mine named Olga Rusikovsky as a K-12 education nonprofit designed to bring teenagers from traditionally underrepresented groups into many universities' AI labs across the country 
for real hands-on experiences with this technology each summer. We started with Stanford AI Lab in 2015, and even in this past COVID summer, through online format, we invited nearly 500 students to 16 different university campuses, from California to Pennsylvania, from Arizona to Georgia. This includes girls and people of color, but we're also eager to reach students of all kinds, uh, students of all kinds, from the rural communities and low-income neighborhoods so often left out of the tech world. Organizations like HAI and AI for All highlight the need for a broad, multi-stakeholder approach to designing and deploying AI. Ultimately, this will have to extend to the national level. I believe the United States remains a powerful force for change, even amidst such historical technological advancement. A big part of this power is our proud and often underappreciated tradition of funding revolutionary research, which serves as both a complement and a counterbalance to industrial research. Government-funded innovation has contributed so much to the modern world, from the internet to mapping of the human genome, and those contributions must continue in the age of AI. This country has also built a principled reputation on human rights, and AI challenges us to live up to it at an ever-growing scale. This means speaking out against the abuses of human rights from AI, and even using AI to uncover and counter repressive use of it. It means using diplomacy to advance a vision of technology governance that embodies our values, working with like-minded countries across the world, and building an effort such as the OECD AI principles and the work of the Global Partnership on AI, GPAI. Next, American universities, which remain some of the most influential and resourceful institutions on earth, are positioned to play a major role in fostering a global culture of human-centered AI. In particular, as educators in engineering and computer science, we have an obligation to ensure our students are learning as much about technology as they are about the world that the technology will affect, such as Harvard's embedded ethics curriculum in their computer science classes, or Stanford's pioneering class on computers, ethics, and public policy. The world needs a new generation of socially conscious, ethically-minded innovators to lead the way, and we can play a role in shaping how they think. There's also more specific actions that can be taken immediately. In recent months, HAI has worked with our Congress to establish a task force to study and create a pathway for, for creating a national research cloud which would allocate considerable resources for AI research outside of the commercial sector, giving our country's students, researchers, and NGOs a route to make novel, meaningful contributions to the field, especially those focused on problems without an immediate financial reward. As the power and accessibility of AI grows, the temptation to use it in ethically questionable ways will only grow all over the world. By taking a principal stand in favor of a resolutely human-centered approach, the United States has an opportunity to lead. At its core, authoritarianism is a doctrine of exclusion. It's the idea that power should be reserved only for a select elite. In contrast, our strength lies in our embrace of inclusion, that everyone can play a role. 
this is an idea reflected in science itself, where your ideas matter, not your status. But as the expression goes, freedom isn't free. It takes vigilance to ensure this circle of inclusion continues to expand. As the power of AI grows and the desire to harness it grows with it, we must recognize that the counterpart to our freedom is the responsibility to protect it. This is a responsibility that falls on all of us. Scientists and researchers who must always imagine their work in the context of the people it may one day impact. Industry leaders who have a growing obligation to consider the societal impact of their business decisions from the technology in their products to the partnerships they form across the world. Policymakers who must work to stay informed and provide a thoughtful counterbalance to these forces. Electorates all over the world who can use their voting power to tell their leaders that technology should serve people and never the other way around. And educators who have an opportunity with each new class to shape the thinkers of tomorrow, ensuring they're not just smart, but ethical, compassionate, and committed to building a world worth living in. The power of AI may be great, but I believe the power of human ingenuity is and remains far greater. So while regimes with malicious aim may harness AI itself, a threat we must continue to take seriously, they'll never harness the ingenuity driving it the way a free society can. Of course, it takes more than virtue to stand up to authoritarianism. So it's important that we recognize our values aren't just moral goods, but competitive advantages with lower, with lower barriers to entry and a commitment to inclusion. We can tap into the full talent of our population. A culture of candor and open debate encourages the critique of bad ideas and the support of good ones. And transparency in both our technology and our leadership fosters trust and a willingness to collaborate with our citizens, corporations, and our allies on the world stage. This is a powerful foundation, not just for innovation, not just for innovating, but for recognizing threats to human rights wherever they may emerge and organizing a principled stand against them. I often quote my friend and colleague, philosopher Shannon Vailer, who is thinking on these matters, has great, whose thinking on these matters has greatly influenced my own. She once said that there are no independent machine values. Rather, machine values are human values. It's a reminder that no matter how autonomous or sophisticated, our technology will always be our responsibility. That even the most advanced intelligent machines are merely extensions of our own intelligence, our best, our worst, and everything in between. As, we, as I reflect on the ideas of our presenters over the last week, Shannon's words have taken on a simpler form. In order to build a future in which AI supports democracy, the democracies of today must support AI. Thank you. Fei Fei, thank you so much for being part of this program. Thank you, Aline, for inviting me. I can't convey how appreciative we are to be able to have this opportunity to collaborate. And I have to say, personally, your story is so inspiring. Thank you. So, so your comments um, did such a good job of reminding us of this complex balance between the vast potential benefits that can come from AI, but also the complex range of downside risks. 
Um, you reminded us we ha all have to be vigilant in protecting our values, including privacy, inclusion, fairness, transparency, and that we have a shared responsibility to protect humanity from malign uses of AI, especially in authoritarian contexts. Um, so as a starting place, um, I want to join your question, your comment about who benefits from AI with your own commitment to inclusion that has been so clear. And I wanna bring this sort of to the global level. We know around the world, there are whole communities, countries, regions, that for a wide variety of reasons are not sharing in the benefits of AI. Given that roughly 40% of the planet is still not digitally connected, it is probably fair to assume that these people are also not adequately reflected in the data that feeds AI, and they are certainly not part of the coding community that is building AI. And this lack of inclusion can have really dramatic um, consequences and even exacerbate existing digital divides and create many new ones. So I'm wondering how you think about these global challenges of inclusion in and exclusion from AI and what Stanford HAI is doing about it. Yeah, thank you, Eileen, for asking such an important question. Um, you know, this has kept me awake for many years now, and uh, that was why I started AI for All, because of the lack of inclusion. And now this uh, um, this question of equity, inclusion, and fairness is now on a global scale. And, uh, you know, as a field, especially a technical field about 60 years old, we haven't paid enough attention to this in the early development of AI. Now we're already seeing severe negative consequences. Just an, as an example you alluded to, uh, just recently my wonderful medical school colleagues just published a JAMA paper showing that most of the healthcare models trained um, with machine learning algorithms are using data from only three states in America, California, Massachusetts, and New York. And this is a significant bias and will have downstream impact in the people who, who this is serving. And internationally, this disparity is even greater, right? Like you said, with entire countries or continents underrepresented or not represented at all. So first of all, I, I still believe the best approach, one of the best approaches is to bake equity and inclusion into the design of AI. This is too important to be left as a patch or afterthoughts or statements. For example, we must think how you will source data and how, how, what the data is representing before you write a line of code. And there are technical solutions like work like data sheet, but there are also important regulatory efforts. And uh, I also mentioned in the talk that a multi-stakeholder approach is critical and the key. We have to invite all stakeholders broadly representing the groups, this might impact um, to the table from the get-go. Technology um, can be a force of good. It actually can call out a lack of inclusion or bias if we use it right. Um, for example, it also, you know, through telehealth, especially in COVID time, we could potentially reach people living in their homes or remotely. Um, but, you know, we have to have the will and the incentive to use technology for good. And at the end, it's still all about people. I'm an educator as much as I'm a scientist, and I firmly believe that um, the future is in, in the hands of all of us. And, uh, you know, we need to focus on inviting America's youth to participate in AI today and become tomorrow's leaders, especially those with all walks of life and traditionally underserved communities. Well, let's bring it even closer to home and talk a little bit more about the Stanford Human Centered uh, AI approach, which I would say is still quite unique in the field. Um, I still remember your early New York Times op-ed uh, entitled Making AI That's Good for People, which was really striking. 
Um, and then soon thereafter, Stanford announced its strategic initiative around this rubric of human centeredness, which for me was wonderful as a human rights advocate. Uh, I think this was really notable because it was not that long ago that there was a very dominant strand of thinking among technologists in Silicon Valley that technology should not be bound up with normative considerations. And that the, the basic idea being that technology was value neutral and that tech progress should not even be impeded by values-based concerns. So I, I guess I'm curious, was there any resistance within the Stanford CS community about using this human-centered approach? Well, thank you, Eileen, for recognizing Stanford is uh, at the forefront of that. I remember early conversations with you back two or three years ago, and you were at the forefront of thinking about human-centered AI, and I was very inspired by you. So, of course, we would not have today's Stanford HAI if it were not for the enthusiastic participation and leadership from many of the computer science colleagues here at Stanford, released to name a few, James Landing, Chris Manning, Surya Ganguly, faculty members of the AI lab, engineering leaders, uh, John Mitchell, Jennifer Widom, university leadership, Persis and Mark Desir Levine, who are both scientists by training. So there is, I, I do feel a cultural shift. I do feel people are recognizing the importance of the human centeredness of, uh, of the <clears throat> technology. But it's also an ongoing, um, unfinished job, right? Um, uh, we do have technologists at Stanford or in Silicon Valley or worldwide who claim that we're just building the tools. I, I respect that, but that's not where I stand and I wanna help build that bridge and uh, HAI at Stanford partnering with Hoover, with you guys, with FSI, with CEPR, and many organizations is doing exactly that. We, we need, you know, I mentioned in my talk, the three intellectual tenets of, of AI, whether it's human inspired technology or human augmenting te technology or, or it's uh, societal or human impact. The, human must be at the center of technological development. So just staying on that theme, as a sign of how much things have changed in terms of this relationship between technology and values, HAI recently set out a communication to the Stanford community reflecting on HAI's responsibility to help combat race-based discrimination and bias. And it included your recognition, here's a quote, uh, we, are, we are aware that technologies are not neutral in design or impact and that there are no machine values, only human values, as you said in your comments. The hard question is, you know, we, we know we have to have much more inclusive data, but, but the harder part seems to be how do we make sure that our values are embedded in the design? and reflected in the design of AI and that the values we want reinforced show up rather than the ones we're struggling to overcome in society? Yeah, no, great question, Eileen. And, uh, you know, we cannot just put things in statements. We have to put them in action. And uh, again, I emphasize on a multi-stakeholder approach to, to know there's no single solution. Uh, but at Stanford, we have multiple avenues to approach this, right? First and foremost, we're an educational institute. So to ensure AI um, or any technology's future uh, to be more inclusive and equitable, we need, need to include all walks of life to participate and to bring those youth and, and, and young people in. Um, traditionally, if you look at the statistics of CS majors, or especially AI track or graduate student numbers, it's not great. The number of faculty in AI um, coming from uh, underrepresented groups is also not great. But um, um, as a community, whether it's computer science or HAI, we've taken this uh, criticisms and public oversights to heart. We've been increasing our leadership composition to people of all backgrounds. We have continued to outreach to AI researchers of all backgrounds. We have established, as you notice, this diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion committee 
to um, to force us into um, uh, structured action and commit to those actions. And we're working closely with organizations like uh, AI for All, Blacking AI, and so on. So that's education. But we also want to improve research cu uh, culture, baking the ethics into the, the design. Um, I'm actually very proud. Um, as far as I know, HAI is the first instance to not only in Stanford, but probably nationwide uh, in AI that is now requiring an, an ethics review process for every research proposal that we plan to fund. And this is led by a group of faculty leaders, Michael Bernstein from Computer Science, Deborah Satz from uh, Humanities, um, and Margaret Levy from Political Science. And um, this is the kind of forcing function that will um, gradually shift the culture. And also we continue to uh, convene and participate in the convening and learning from experts and leaders. I want to serve as a hub to this kind of inclusive conversation. Uh, one example was our fall conference back in uh, 2019 on AI governance and policy. We included voices from ACLU, uh, from Algorithmic Justice League, from the White House, from the partnership in AI, along with our nation's leading scholars in technology, governance, cybersecurity, political science, ethics, law, and more. And then recently, we held a uh, facial recognition technology workshop where, um, again, from uh, ACLU, from uh, Justice uh, Algorithm Justice League, to industry leaders, to uh, governments like um, uh, NIST, um, and, and, and academians come and, and uh, have that kind of open, transparent, and inclusive conversation. So just to conclude, conclude this multi-stakeholder approach is one important way to ensure inclusion. So um, I want to highlight one of the most inspiring lines from your comments was this uh, sentence, I believe our greatest achievements as a species is the recognition of our shared inalienable humanity. And that really sounds like human rights language to me. Um, as you know, this whole program um, has revolved around and used human rights as the normative lens through which to assess the impact of AI on people and on humanity. Um, we believe that the human rights framework provides a really strong basis for assessing the impact of AI. And we also think it's valuable because it has served as the normative pillar of the post-World War II international order for the past 70 years. And so it's a very much globally recognized concepts and language. And several uh, US-based private sector AI companies, explicitly Microsoft as a leader in this, have turned to human rights impact assessments rather than just ethical evaluations, human rights impact assessments to evaluate the effects of their products and services. And I'm curious whether HAI has ever considered using human rights language when considering the impacts of AI. Yeah, so uh, we're, um, we are all and continue to be students of human rights. The 1948 uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the UN explicitly committed us to the notion that there are um, a certain set of rights and freedom inherent to all of humanity. So it is important to all of us to ensure that technologies we develop and deploy not only respect those rights and uh, wherever possible further them. So I cannot speak for everyone at HAI or in AI, but I want to just uh, highlight three small uh, quick examples of uh, where I see this is happening. Um, one example is my own healthcare work that um, part of human rights declaration talks about privacy and di dignity. And uh, this is something we pay close attention when we work with our bioethicists and our stakeholders like patients, care uh, takers and clinicians about respecting their privacy and dignity and how we can design this AI smart sensor technology to, to help 
their recovery, health, uh, medical recovery, while respecting their privacy and dignity. Um, another example um, is actually uh, related to human rights um, um, of the most vulnerable population in the world. And this is uh, Professor Jens um, uh, Heimler's work from political science department and also supported by HAI research grant. He and his uh, machine learning colleagues work on how to use data-driven machine learning methods to improve refugee and immigration policies, including bettering the refugee placement uh, process. And this is very much motivated by that. Last but not least, um, Hai is also a community of incredible talents. Our very own HAI International Policy Fellow, Marichi Shaki, was a Dutch and European Union politician. And she is now an uh, outspoken voice in technology governance, democracy, and human rights. Well, that, yes, Marich is a very good friend and we're all very pleased she's part of this Stanford community now. Yeah, So definitely. I think last question, because we've taken up a lot of your time. Um, I wanna talk about, uh, High's efforts to help the United States stay competitive, which you referenced in your comments. It's competitive in AI research and development, as well as in the field of AI education. Um, you also emphasize the special attraction to and draw of American universities from students and researchers around the world, due in large part because of our open liberal democratic values, which is at the heart of our education system. You yourself were one of those brilliant minds drawn to the United States, and you are now a globally renowned professor and scientist helping the United States stay at the top of the field. So last question, from your vantage point, what can and must the United States do, not only to preserve our open values-driven education system, but to ensure that U.S. universities have the opportunity to continue to draw students from around the world and to be a beacon to those who want to study in the United States. Yeah, thank you, Eileen. Of course, uh, I totally agree with you. I cannot agree more that America has played such a special role in the last uh, century or at least many decades to, uh, to, for being this most fertile ground for innovation in science and technology. We, mentioned internet, GPS, gene sequencing, uh, laser, uh, of course, AI, just to name a few, right? And um, as we both agree, our values, our, our free open society, our entrepreneurial spirit are part of our competitive advantage. And I would like to see the values preserved. I would like to see we continue to support the most innovative scientific work and of course, we need to adapt to today's challenges from inclusion to continued um, path for immigration of world talent to ethical development of this technology. Uh, we need collaborations among government, higher education, civil society, industry, and, and especially the support of our nation's research community. I actually want to share with you, um, as a closing uh, remark, a story of a student called Stephanie, and she's uh, an alumni of AI for All, a daughter of a single mother immigrant from uh, Mexico. Stephanie grew up in the trailer parks in the strawberry fields of Central California, but she found her passion in computer science and AI as a high schooler. So she came to. Uh, AI for All at Stanford campus during her high school freshman summer. And she fell in love with machine learning and was determined to use this technology to help her community. So she went back to Salinas, California and used data-driven methods to study water qualities of her community. And she's now a college freshman at Stanford pursuing her passion in computer science. So having crossed paths and taught a student like Stephanie is both her American story and mine. It really humbles me that our system um, welcomed people like Stephanie and me 
and can continue to support students and future leaders like Stephanie through education, through research, and, um, and through a shared passion to use technology for good. And we need more of this. So um, that's, uh, that's how I feel about this. Thank you. Well, I have to say your story and your work is so inspiring. And I just want to thank you again for being part of the program and really giving us a chance to underscore and highlight the very unique interdisciplinary nature of the Stanford Human Centered AI Initiative. Thank, thank you, you, Eileen. And thank you, Larry. Um, this work has only just begun. We have a lot of shared work to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, first, let me say on behalf of Larry Diamond and the Global Digital Policy Incubator, I want to thank our partners in this remarkable collaboration, the Hoover Institution, Human Rights Foundation, and Stanford HAI. By way of closing, we wanted to very briefly underscore a few of the core themes and concerns that ran throughout the program, starting with the key question posed right at the top by Larry Diamond. What happens to political freedom, human dignity, international peace and security when the world's most powerful authoritarian regime bids to become the dominant AI superpower? Another recurring theme was that in 21st century digitized societies, economic power, military power, geopolitical power, and even normative power will all derive in substantial part from dominance in AI. I want to go back to day one of the program where Condi Rice reminded us that the values and institutional constraints in the societies where AI tools are built and applied will determine whether this technology serves human freedom or state control. While she said she's betting on free societies to win the AI race, she reminded us that the outcome is not certain, but that the winner in AI will have the power to shape the international order going forward. Day one, we also got a very graphic picture from our first panel of how AI already is being used for surveillance, censorship, and to control civic narratives in China, but also very chillingly to intentionally stifle human agency and autonomy. Several panelists that day went so far as to suggest that rather than digital authoritarianism, the term digital totalitarianism may be more apt. On day two, we discussed a range of ethical challenges faced by non-Chinese private sector tech companies doing business in China, as well as the implications of Trump administration policies toward China. Our keynote, keynote speaker that day, Eric Schmidt, underscored the point that leadership in AI matters because AI is and will continue to be the enabler of progress in every other realm. He also gave us a very sobering assessment that unless something dramatically changes, we can expect the US to hold on to its lead in AI for about two years, but not much longer. That said, rather than advocating for a complete and blunt decoupling of the US-Chinese tech sectors, Eric suggested we should see the US-China relationship as a rivalry partnership where we simultaneously compete, but also seek ways to collaborate with China, especially on transnational challenges, even as we selectively retreat from projects that undermine national security. Day three, Mike Brown, director of the Defense Innovation Unit, made a plea for increased US investment in R&D for AI and said the US should approach the AI marathon with China the way we approached the Manhattan Project during World War II or the space race during the Cold War. Our panelists that day talked about implications of China's export of surveillance tech and digital infrastructure, especially for international peace and security. But they also reminded democracies that we need to get our own houses in order, especially in terms of building those institutional constraints on AI applications. So we do not drift unconsciously toward digital authoritarian practices ourselves. Today in our final segment, we heard very inspiring words and nuanced comments from Taiwan's digital minister, Audrey Tang, about what China's ambition looks like from Taiwan. 
and about the consequences of its ability to mine data, shape the international community toward a rule by law model rather than a rule of law model. And panelists today shared recommendations for how democracies can and should respond to China's push to be the world's AI superpower, underscoring the need for democracies to work together, not just on defense, but proactively on offense with respect to open research, international diplomacy, especially in the standard setting realm, and in attracting the best and the brightest technologists. They also reminded us we don't need to out China, China. Finally, we just heard Stanford's own Fei Fei Li talk about how Stanford HAI understands its responsibilities to ensure that the values embedded in AI reflect the human values we want to re reinforce rather than the values we seek to eradicate. We thank all of our amazing speakers for being part of this program and our hope is that this conference will contribute to the larger societal conversation about AI and our future. And I will now turn it back to Larry and or Alex. Alex is next. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you for those wonderful concluding remarks, uh, Eileen. I just wanna thank uh, Eileen and Larry specifically. We've been working on this event for about 10 months now and it's wonderful to see it all come together and thank you to the guests and the speakers. Uh, it has been beyond our expectations. And again, we hope that this can start a trend. My colleagues and I at the Human Rights Foundation are extremely interested in making sure that human rights violations, privacy issues, civil liberties issues are at the heart of these academic and uh, business and industry debates about where AI should go. When we talk about machine learning, we talk about algorithms that are used to do things uh, ranging from determining whether you know prisoners should go on parole in the United States to you know, interning people in China. I mean, this is a wide range of issues and it's really great from HRF's perspective to see this whole event uh, drill down on, bring experts on and focus on what's happening in China simply because, you know, from a statistical point of view, this is the world's largest experiment on people with AI or, or if you prefer to call it sort of, um, you know, uh, machine learning or, or, you know, any sort of like, you know, specific AI. This is the largest uh, social impact of this new technology on a population, and it should be at the heart of every conversation, and it hasn't been so far. So we hope that this event can, can start a trend and we can keep these conversations going, and it doesn't have to be hostile or, uh, you know, it can be amicable, it can be friendly. Um, there's every reason to include uh, people on both sides here, um, but the fact is a lot of what's made in China um, is going to be rolled out, as we've seen throughout these conversations, is already being rolled out to the rest of the world. And those people in those countries don't have a choice. They don't have a vote, usually. A lot of them are living in authoritarian countries. And they're not going to get to have a say in the future fintech uh, or, you know, the future sort of like police tech that's being used in their societies. So, again, this debate is so essential from a human rights perspective. We at HRF have been overjoyed to play a role and a part in this. And you know, thank you again, Eileen and, and Larry, for helping us put together what we think is going to become really an existential conversation here as we go through the next decade. Well, uh, thank you, uh, both of you. Uh, just as we have repeatedly uh, heard about the importance of uh, democratic alliances and partnerships uh, in meeting this challenge, so, Alex, as you note, know, uh, this conference has been a long and fruitful partnership among four organizations. So I want to begin, uh, Alex Gladstein, you and your colleagues at the Human Rights Foundation, Jenny Wong, Joy Park, and Sherry Jing, for uh, your collaboration in this project. I want to thank uh, my partner, the executive director uh, in the Global Digital Policy Incubator, our former ambassador to the Human Rights Council uh, in uh, Geneva, UN Human Rights Council, Eileen Donahoe, and our other team members at the Global Digital Policy Incubator, Megan Metzger, Kip Wainscott, and Tracy Navichoke. I wanna give just a profound personal thanks uh, to Dr. Fei-Fei Li uh, for her really uplifting and uh, perfectly pitched and as Eileen said, uh, inspiring uh, concluding remarks 
and reflections uh, in that great conversation. And I want to also thank the new uh, but old friend to us at Hoover, Director of Policy at HAI, uh, Russell Wald. Finally, I want to thank my Hoover colleagues. This has really been a challenging uh, conference to produce, much more than it may have seemed because it was so beautifully and tirelessly and effectively administered. Uh, I want to thank first Dr. Glenn Tiffert, who is uh, my colleague in the project on China's global sharp power uh, at the Hoover Institution and who helped to shape this conference. We're deeply grateful uh, to the new director of the Hoover Institution, our former Secretary of State, Dr. Condoleezza Rice, for her support of this work and her embrace uh, and uh, eloquent introduction of this conference. And finally, I want to thank the team at Hoover that made this possible. Betsy Phillips, Senior Manager of Hoover's Events and Planning, who was our um, flawless and extraordinarily uh, talented uh, producer of this event, and her colleagues uh, in the Hoover Events team, Mike Wong and Tara Mahan. I want to thank uh, Shauna Farley, Hoover's Associate Director, for marketing and policy education, and our content manager, Ellen Santiago. And finally, I want to thank once more all of our speakers and all of you, some 3,000 of you who have tuned into this event and shared with us your questions and your commitment to a digital world that is governed by human rights values. Thank you all so much, and our conference now concludes. Mm -hmm.